Welcome. Uh, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. Glad you joined me. Uh, awesome show for you today. Warren Sapp uh, today as we look a little back, a little forward, go over some of the big news in the NFL, talk a little college football with Warren Sapp. Steve Kim's also going to be here, talk some NFL college football with us. Tennessee Harmony going to be here today. Uh, Anthony and Virgil, we're going to talk about Gideon's Army. Uh, TJ Moe, still in studio uh, with me uh, all this week and still here with us today. Round of applause for TJ Moe. Uh, great job. Thank you, TJ, for coming. Uh, we'll get to Warren Sapp here in a minute. Before I do that, I want to talk to you guys about uh, prize picks, one of our great new sponsors. Will you be testing your skills on prize picks this football season? It's the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Prize picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. My mom loves to play Prize Picks, loves to watch football, loves to turn $10 into $250. She plays every week. These are her picks for this NFL Sunday. Tyree Hill, more than 88 and a half receiving yards, like that. Nick Folk, more than one and a half field goals, kind of like that. Dak Prescott, less than 241 and a half passing yards. I love that. He's playing the San Francisco 49ers. My mother's got some good picks here. See if you're better than her. Prize Picks now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this football season. Go to prizepicks.com slash fearless. Use the code fearless for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash fearless. Use my promo code fearless. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Without further ado, let's bring in the QB killer and have the greatest conversation about football that you will see anywhere on TV, on the internet. Uh, I always look forward to this. I have no idea what Warren's going to say. I just know it's going to be interesting. Uh, Warren, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, I, I got some clips I want to play for you of Marshawn Lynch uh -oh. talking about Russell Wilson. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, no, but it doesn't no, sound no, like Marsha. You have not. Seen, yeah, Marshawn <laughs> and uh, Russell Wilson were not BFF. I I don't think they were enemies, but they were not BFF. Uh, let's play the clip. What happened with that relationship, man? You <laughs> look, man. I'm gonna tell you straight up. I'm 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 not the. I wouldn't be the the, the right person to to speak on their relationship because. I didn't, like, I didn't, I didn't f with him. You feel what I'm saying? So. You didn't mess with who? I didn't f with, with Pete. Uh -huh. And then, I mean, you know, Russ was, like, just a quarterback for me. Right. You know what I mean? So it wasn't as. We, you didn't have no relationship? You didn't have no kind of a relationship? Y'all didn't, y'all didn't, like, go to a, go, go to a party? Y'all didn't get together? Y'all didn't do it? Y'all didn't kick it like that? <laughs> I mean, I mean. <laughs> I mean, you go, there's nothing. I, I, like, I, I respect Russell as, you know, feel me, as a player and as a teammate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, anything that I say, you feel me, because of the situation, you know, throwing the pick on the goal line, not giving me the ball, this, that, and the third, him, you know, leaving from Seattle, you know, going over to the, anything that I say is going to come off as, you know, malice or as if I'm, you know, a hater. or right. Because, I mean, you know what, I, you know, I, I, I'll take Russ. And I put him right there at quarterback, and I rock with him right. because I have done that. Right. But I mean, you know, as far as anything else, it's like it, there's y'all no, didn't have a relationship outside of football. No, nah, there's no. I mean, it, can't right. pick up the phone and and, and, and call old right. boy or nothing. Right. And then I mean, you know, what you mean you couldn't pick up the phone? I mean, I, you, I don't got a number. Oh, oh, well, but you would. I mean, but you, you know, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. <laughs> You gotta love a bluntly honest I, brother. 
I mean, you got to just love it. I mean, yeah. it's beast mode, baby. He, he coming. He coming every time. If he got the ball or he ain't got the ball, he in an interview, even in his commercials, he coming. I love it. You got to love. You got to love beast mode, baby. Come on. Yeah. But but let me get this clear. He said he didn't F with Pete, right? Pete or Russ. Oh, but, yeah, he said Pete Carroll, too. Yeah. Yeah. Both Basically, right. both of them, yes. He, so and, and again, he, he didn't say it. He didn't say it with a super negative twist, and he 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 talked no, at no, some no, point no, no, about. No, no, no. I, I I like in that situation to me and Keyshawn. I respect him as a player. I respect him as a teammate. I just didn't f with him. I ain't got Keyshawn's number, but when I saw him, you know, I, I say hello to him at the reunions and whatever. But we don't we don't do each other. Not, that's there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but is it a situation where Warren Sapp, a defensive tackle, and a wide receiver can have that relationship? Can a quarterback have that relationship with someone, the guy in the not backfield usually. with it? Not usually. One that's got to protect you on third down and read the blitz. No, that's normally not the guy you want to be on those kind of terms with. I will agree with you there because you know my rule, my coach, my quarterback, and my kicker are the most sacred things on my football team. So, but Marshawn's different, baby. Come on, that's beast mode. You, you, you gotta just take it. You, you gotta take what you get, come on. <laughs> Here's what I'm wondering though. Are we unfair to Russell Wilson? Are we piling on Russell Wilson? To me, he's a nerdy, socially awkward person mm -hmm. and that's okay and if he played outside linebacker or cornerback <laughs> or left tackle, no one would care. No one would care, yeah. But I, at the quarterback position, you got to kind of be more of a social animal. Well, I tell you what, I just want to know where dangerous went. I'm talking about the man that threw the prettiest, most accurate deep ball we've seen in the National Football League. I want that quarterback. I want that quarterback that went to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. I don't want the end result of the second Super Bowl when you decide you ain't going to get a ball to beast mode just because Bill, Bill Belichick put in his goal line package. <laughs> right, right. I ain't seen many goal line packages that'll stop this man. I mean, you you, you got to be special. And that's what he was. And they made a poor decision. And now you see the outcome of it right there in that interview. My goodness. I would never want one of my team, except Keyshawn. Keyshawn can have fun with me. You know, me and him had a lot of fun, you know, talking a little trash to each other. But other than him, I'd feel a certain type of way if one of my teammates talked like that about me. What was the issue with you and Keyshawn? Why, why didn't y'all click? Uh, he followed me around the Pro Bowl the whole 1999 year when, you know, lobbied me, you know, put his wife with my wife, kids with my kids. Hey, man, I'm telling you, dog, you just lost the, the championship 11 to 6. I'll get you that touchdown. I guarantee you. Me, me and you come together, we're going to get a Super Bowl, whatever. So I'm like, all right. So I go in because when you lose the NFC Championship game back in the day, your coaching staff is now the coaching staff for the Pro Bowl. And Tony Dungy and us had a situation where we were, you know, about to fire Mike Mike Shula because the, the Glaciers weren't happy with the performance in the championship game. And then Tony said, if you fire him, you got to fire us all. So we almost lost our whole coaching staff. But that that came back together. And then I, I, I lobbied for Keyshawn on the team. I'm like, yo. Let's go get him. He wants, but he's gonna make more money than you. I have no. I, what? That that is never an issue in my locker room. Wives, kids, and money is off limits. So he came on the team. They got him a nice contract. We in the off season running around me, Brooks, and Lynch, and Rondé, the whole crew out there doing what we do in the off season. And there's no Keyshawn. I said, you said you're gonna leave my offense, dog. Where, where you at, baby? Oh, um, I got some things in L.A. I need to take care of, you know. I'm like, no, 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 no. You told me you was going to leave my offense, so now I need you here. And now when he gets here, we break the huddle. <laughs> he don't know the play. He don't know where to line up. He don't know if he on or off the ball. Oh, man, trust me, dog. And then he didn't like Sean King. I'm like, well, Keyshawn, you're not getting another quarterback. <laughs> this is what you signed up for. We have Sean King, my man. You got to get along with King. Nah. Nah. And you know you don't bother my quarterback. Wow. So, so I'm telling you, it, it was ugly. It, I mean, at times we, we did some good things together and won a championship, no doubt about it. But Gruden just, ooh, Gruden pushed every button in his body.
I mean, Gruden was going to hold you responsible for every what? It, it was beautiful because Tony was, you know, mild mannered, never cursed. You know, made sure we was all, you know, on the details and everything. And, you know, just wouldn't really push the button. You know, the, we'll play field position, three and punt. We'll play great defense and whatever. Man, Keyshawn took full advantage of that, man. I'm telling you, took full advantage of it. And, no, nah, he, he didn't lead us at all. That's why we went and got Jared Vicious and went and got Keenan McCardle. <laughs> he was not and, leading. And then – and and because again, I can remember being in the locker room, and I don't remember it was a playoff game or whatever, <laughs> where Keyshawn took a pot shot at Tony and triggered me. And, oh, and he I was remember, special. And, oh no, he was special, dog. I'm telling you, on, on a whole nother level, dog. Whole nother level, man. Whole nother level. But uh, but uh, but other stuff, he's a good brother. I mean, I ain't got nothing wrong with him. But as a teammate, I'd never take him again. No. Mm-mm. Do, and, you know, this is an unfair question, so feel free to say, man, don't ask me that. That's silly. It's, it's an unfair question, but I'm just going to ask, and so I'll tell you. No, let, let, let's play the did, game. Did, well, it's, a, it's really an unfair question because I'm asking you to speak for others. Did other people feel the same way as you about Keyshawn? Oh, no, I, can, I, I, I couldn't put the boys underneath the bus, but I'll tell you this. When we come together for our reunions, they say, Sap, do the Keyshawn for us. <laughs> I got a conversation of him coming out of the hallway. I'm telling you, I'll do it for you. Next time we live together, I'll do it for you. You'll love this. I'm telling you, Brooks, Gooch, any of retail, any of Jacquez, all of them will tell you this. It's just, it, it's just a fact. It's just an absolute fact. Mm. Did, did, did it ever come to, you know, no. like... No, squaring no, no, off? No, 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 no. That's not fair. I'm a 300-pound defensive tackle that take on <laughs> guards, tackles, and sitters. That's not fair. No, no, no. That that'll destroy your locker room because you know some dudes really do. You know, you know, admire him and you know follow him and go behind him. I'm telling you. I mean, he he's a charismatic young man with with a bunch of great talent that he just wouldn't capitalize and, and work on and and, and come and, and grind. He wouldn't grind with us. He wouldn't. He he knows that now. And so he's like he skipped basically the off season the whole off program. Season. The whole off season. OTAs was out of town. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Nah, it wasn't. Nah, he didn't. Wow. I'll lead you. Wow. I'll lead that offense. I'll get you more than eleven points, man. I, like yesterday, dog. I was defensive player of the year. All that. I mean, come on. I mean, I was I, I was on top of the world. I was on top of the world. I just, I just missed it. I just missed my first Super Bowl. And I got one of the the first down makers in the NFL. You know, go across the middle because, you know, it was dangerous across the middle back then. You know, you got to have somebody yeah. that's willing to go in there and run that bang eight. And Key would do all that. I mean, first down, man. Come on, baby. Let's go. I need some of that in my life. <laughs> so I, I, I combined forces with him. We got a championship. But I can understand that sentiment that, that Russell has. But not for his coach, though. Not for his coach. <laughs> Ooh. You talk Marshawn. 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 Yeah, yeah, the beast. The beast yeah, mode. Yeah. Not for your coach, though, dog. Come on. The coach called the plays. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I, I want to go back to Russell. Coolness. All right. Yeah. Go back to dangerous. I, I want to go back to Russell Wilson uh, just a little bit because I actually feel sorry for him. I, I, I think he is who he is, he's mixed race. Uh, he's a bit of a nerd, and I've seen a guy tr- do everything he can trying to reach across the aisle, basically, and be able to connect with Marshawn in a way that he, you know, he, he, he just, I'm just going to keep it real because we do that on this show. <laughs> he divorced his white wife, <laughs> married Sierra or CR or whatever, and he, he put some bass in his voice and, you know, tries, he plays dress up over Instagram and tries to be hip and cool. All of this to me is outreach to that side of the locker room that he doesn't naturally connect with. And, and I don't think it's his fault. He's, he's Tiger Woods, basically. And Tiger Woods plays golf, an individual sport. And, and Russell's not allowed to be a goofball 
in the NFL, I guess. It is, are we holding Russ to a fair standard over his personality? I, you know what? I, I'm really not a social media guy, so I don't know much about the dress up. But Tiger Woods is in a basically white sport. And you can be as quirky as you like when you hit that damn ball like he does. <laughs> so Russell could be as quirky as he likes on my football team when he throws that nice, long, deep ball that introduced us to balling and locking and all those, you know, back-to-back Super Bowls. I mean, your quarterback should be untouchable, but not to a, to a point where he can't tell a joke or, you know, get in the pool for the Masters or get in the pool for the Open or any of that good stuff that, you know, Trent Dilfer used to do because – I'm telling you, Whitlock, the greatest teammate I've had that was not a premier player was Trent Dilfer. I mean, he could touch any corner of the locker room with, oh, with precision, absolute precision. He, oh, just just a wonderful, just a wonderful teammate, absolute wonderful teammate. And he wasn't a great player, and you, you couldn't hate him. As many pick six in bad situations he put me in, I still love to this day. I got him on speed now. That's my dog. I love I love me some Trent Dilfer. When he was doing his little dime thing on, on the TV, I loved it. I mean, Trent Dilfer is that guy, dog. I'm telling you. I, I, that's oh, no, the, that's I, the, I believe you. Oh, no. no I, I trust I've met you. I wouldn't say it out, I would say it out yeah. my mouth if I, if I didn't believe you. You know this, car. That, that mother is something special, boy. But not everybody has that. Not everybody has that. I mean, I, I've been on teams with Sean King. I've been on teams with Kelly Holcomb. <laughs> I've been on teams with Aaron Brooks, Kerry Collins. You know what I'm saying? I've had a whole whirlwind. Andrew Waters, the toughest screw to ever do a turn at Oakland. I mean, it just – and normally they're a little quirky, but they'll bend to wherever you want to go because this is their team, and they want to be accepted and loved because they're the face of the franchise. And – Russell's got to be able to handle that. Come on, Willock. Come on. Come on. I, I just can't well, see it. He, you, he's got to have some soul, ain't he? Come on. I mean, he plays well, baseball. You, you're, making a great, you're making a great point. It's like, hey, if Trent Dilfer Come on. can figure out a way to connect with every corner of the locker room, that's yeah. not an unfair standard to hold Russell Wilson to. What great other point. locker room he's ever been in that's, that's all white or whatever? It's 80% black in, or more in most locker rooms in the National Football and in college. Well, where he go to school at? That, that was so, he didn't go to BYU. I mean, to, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Went to Wisconsin and was it North Carolina State? Wolfpack. Maybe? Wolfpack, yeah, yeah, down in North Carolina. Yeah, There's plenty of brothers in North Carolina. Plenty of brothers down there. Come on, man. And his old lady should give him some soul, too. Come on, man. Who she hang out with? Who well, her friend? <laughs> ATL don't visit. <laughs> ATL don't visit. Look, I got. I gotta say, Marshawn has got to be right because even Sean Payton, an old white guy, then he goes to Denver and says, "Hey man, take that pole out of your rear end." Right? <laughs> come on, come on. I mean, but you got to know this: Sean Payton coached Marshall Falk. So trust this. So I mean, you got to know what you what you're dealing with when you talk about certain individuals. Certain individuals have been through the rigors with some real brothers in front of their face talking. So come on with it. You know what I'm saying? I know Sean Payton's like, come on with it at all times. Yes, sir. Huh. Uh, I want to move on to uh, Jamal Adams. Uh, I don't. Did you see this where he <laughs> they put him in concussion protocol? And pulled him out of the game, and 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 he snapped. All right. I I, I actually like it. I, I, I oh, like no, no, it. No, 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 no. Let's go back to the day he was drafted in the National Football League. With like, do you remember that? No. He said, "I'll die for this shit," and you saw it right there on Monday Night Football on full display. That's exactly what he said when he got in the National Football League. That's a kid that got drafted by the Giants, right? I believe so. Yeah. Let me, his you, dad, got, you got dad me double played, checking. And his dad played in the league, too. Because I looked him up. I'm like, wait a minute. I ain't heard, I ain't heard nothing this, this wild in a long time. I die about this? Nah, dog. So I looked him up. Dad played in the league. And I think he was the 17th pick. I'm like, he done lost his rabbit. You got to be kidding me, dog. To my dying about this. Nah. Jets. Never that. Jets. 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 I Played knew it was New York. Jets, not yeah, the that was the Jets. That yeah. was the Jets. I'd die about this. I knew it was in New York. I knew it was in New York. I'm like, he's he tripping. 
Petrie. And he a silver spoon, baby. His daddy played in the league, dog. You got a trust fund somewhere sitting. Nice bank account. Yeah, come on, die about this? It's a kid's game. You get a king's ransom. You better take care of your head. You ain't getting but one brain, one set of teeth. You better wake up, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. It, clearly, he was he was a little woozy. You know, you know, got hit in the back of the head like that with a, with a with a help. I mean, with a knee. Come on, I, I watched Steve Young eyes rolling in the back of his head when Hardy did him like that in '97, August 31st. You don't no. no. Uh, old NFL? Yeah, you're coming back. <laughs> but the new one? No, nah, brother. Come on. And so if they if you went into that protocol, felt like you could play, and they told you you couldn't play, you would have just accepted that? Yeah. That's the new league. That's the new league. That's a lot better than have a you know, uh, why you uh, say it? That's a hey, that's a lot better than having a, a rheumatologist as the as the doctor that's over the concussion protocol. I bet you that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I had for my 13 oh, t- years. A rheumatologist over the NFL concussion uh, policy. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, you don't want that. I promise you, you don't want that. <laughs> TJ Moe is over here shaking his head, Warren. I don't know if you, I think you met TJ when you yeah, came to town. Yeah, I know TJ. Come TJ, on with it, T. What you got, baby? Yeah. Come on. Well, I, I've been, you know, I played college football at University of Missouri. I've been knocked out on the field. And, and th- this was 2010, and I came back in the game. And I, had, I, was, I was far from the only guy doing that. I just would be stunned if they could keep you off the field. But I'm shaking my head because you said you, you would just let them shake. I, I, the Warren Sapp that I, got, I saw I play, I can't hey, imagine. Uh, TJ, I'm going to say this to you now. As you look back at that situation, if it happened to you now, or you can go back and do it again, would you do it again, TJ? Yeah, in that mindset. No, 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 know, no, 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 no. You fully have all the knowledge that you have now. Now, let's rewind the clock. And your mental is where it is today. And you go back to that situation and you get knocked out. Would you put yourself back in that game if somebody said, no, you're not? I'm not going to allow you back in that game. Would you, would you go into, you know, a, a Judge Judy moment, you know, kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? An old, old Jerry Springer moment and just, just go all the way out. I'm going Come back on, in, man. Oh I'm going goodness. back in. You know I, I'm always going back in. Is, DJ? <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain what, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to tell no, you the I difference is, Juan. what he's saying. The, the, the monster in me, I broke a 34th metacarpal. I told him we wrapping this up and I'm going back in. But, my bones will heal. My head is a total different issue. And now what we know, that's all I'm, uh, that's all I'm saying. What we know now, it, you it, have it. to take a different approach. We got parents but out there. But here's what TJ knows now that you aren't recognizing. Mm-hmm. That Warren Sapp has Hall of Fame talent and a contract that matches his Hall of Fame talent. TJ is in his mind is like, I'm still going to be a borderline guy that's here for special teams and to maybe catch some third down passes. And so I got to take risk that others wouldn't take. Am I accurate, TJ? Yes, absolutely. The other thing DJ. I'd say is I just... DJ, you, ever, just played think, the, uh, you ever played the privileged bingo game? No. I want you to look that uh, card up and I want you to play it after we have this discussion. And then... <laughs> Let me know how you feel about, you know, what risk you were willing to take. <laughs> I was off a dirt it, road today I... with no air conditioning, no cable television, and the pizza man did not deliver. So trust me, young man, I took way more risk in this game of football to get my mother on Easy Street for the last 28 years than you were willing to take. I just promise you that. Just, just I, I'm just, I just can't believe that a, a smart individual like yourself now with the knowledge that you have know that you just bruised your brain and you're going to turn around and I'm going back in and get me some more. Huh? No, T. I wouldn't question the path that you took, but I will tell <laughs> no, you no, this. No, 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 no. I'm questioning I've, the path I've read these that studies. you're going to go back and take. That's what I'm questioning. Yes. With knowledge yes. now of what, Look, you, man. what it does to your brain. You. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. When you, when you sign up for football... When, when I signed up for football, I knew what I was getting into. And look, I mean, I actually, you can see there's, there's video of me in the first quarter of a game, knocked out cold, and I'm jogging while I'm coming to on the sideline. 
And I said, give me five minutes. And this was before you had independent neurologist people on the sidelines. And I went back in the game and I had another six, seven catches. And I had 100 yards a game and, and, and I was good. And I'm good today. And I don't believe these CTE studies, they're rigged. I'm t I, the, everything, I get it, everybody's met with this. I'm uh, you want me, Dr. Cantor, Alu guy, whatever, the doctor. You want me to set you up a meeting with Dr. Cantor up at BU and you go look at the brains? And you go sit down I've and have a conversation? Go, I mean, go sit down and have a, there's nothing that they can show you on a brain scan that can tell you that your, your brain is bruised or you're on your way to CTE until you're dead. That's why we. That's why they're doing the research and the different things. You, you just have to sit with Doc. I, I got one for you. I was in Minnesota in Triple H, Herbert Hubert, uh, Herbert H. Hubert, uh, Metrodome, and Robert Smith came out and I was doing a bark where I come out and I got contained. And Randall Cunningham loaded one up with that long release, and I called myself gonna jump. That's why I tell all D linemen we're not here for batted balls. So I called myself gonna jump for the ball, and Robert. Smith took my feet out from underneath me and I hit the back of my head. And we're like, you know, when you're gut and everything rolling in your mouth, <laughs> and you got to kick out of it as a big man. Like, oh Lord, man, I looked at the sideline and it went sideways. I shook it. I said, ooh, room spinning like I shitty drunk. I'm telling you, it was spinning, boy. I'm telling you, I said, Tyoka, go, go. He goes in the game. I'm telling you, I, it, it, everything is moving. I'm talking about like I just had a fifth of E&J right that day, right there. I'm telling you. I went on the sideline, sprayed me some water on my face, put a little water in my mouth. I think I went and had two sacks at the end of the game. We won that thing. I understand going back in. Oh, no. I've yeah. never been knocked out. You said knocked out. Did they put the smell of yeah. sauce on you, son? They killed some more brain cells no, no, with I the came smell too. of sauce. You do know that, right? <laughs> 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 Here, here's the one thing that I tell you. The, the, reading this study myself is what, what, when everybody, all the pressure about CT, the study that everybody cites is that you had 101 brains donated, and they said, we study these, see who's got CT, and 97 of them came back and had CT. Well, this was not a randomized study. This was the people who thought they had CT. That the big is finding incorrect. is you had four morons who thought they had CT that were just stupid. No, that, I that tend to agree with TJ. Well, I, I, I'm sure I fell into the conspiracy. Any disease that you can only diagnose in death? Come on, Warren. Oh, so you're going to say that Dr. Mahler you know, was a witch doctor, too? That's what you want to say? <clears throat> no, I'm going to say that he's part of the a prop <laughs> being used to destroy football. And what, what do you? how come Dick Buckus and everybody from that era doesn't have CTE? You sit and talk with Dick Buckus? No, we, we we DM over Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, Dick, Dick, Dick could tell you he's stiff, slow, and his memory and everything is a, is way less than it was. We just yeah, he's so so's my mother. So's my mother. She never played in the NFL. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, on, that, that, I, 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 hey, I'll tell you this. When your mother pass and my mother pass, we'll both give them uh, brain brain scans and we'll see what they got. How about that? And we'll have that discussion. <laughs> I'm trying to. If I I'm if I if, if, if the good Lord allow us to you know bury our mothers and our mothers not bury us because that, that that that'd be a, that'd be horrible. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> a mother a mother should have to do that. Should have to bury the child. So let, let's go with that. How about that? And then we'll then we'll have another discussion at a later date, my brother. Well, I'm just saying, Dick Buckus is 80. My mother's I 83. I understand. And when yeah. and when uh, my mother's 78, I understand what you said. And when when Dick Buckus go away, if his family is be so kind to you know donate the brain to the to the brain study to Kirkson the Legacy Foundation, we'll see what we got. But Aaron Hernandez has right, stayed full, and he wasn't 30. And you watch the way he played. He played with nothing but his head. Anytime. I mean, they had a whole documentary, not a swamp. And Aaron Hernandez didn't play in Florida with Tim Tebow. Wow. How could you do that? Shame on that executive producer. Shame. <laughs> 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 you go tell I want to. I want right. <laughs> let, let me let me uh, ask you. Uh, let's move on from the concussion deal. Uh, the forty, not the forty nineers. Jerry Jones oh, has, man. has stated that he ain't got uh, no more pitches. He think no more pitches, right? The, no, no. He said the, oh, the Super Bowl most no more likely <laughs> goes through San oh, Fran. I don't have to tell you. 
Yeah, I like to say, let's Fran. play Jerry Jones talking about the 49ers. Let, let's play that. Do you look at San Fran as a gauge, a test to see where you guys are, or do you not look at it like that and it's just another game? No, I don't, I don't at all look at it as uh, that. Uh, I look at it as uh, uh, we know they're uh, one of, if not, uh, the teams that are playing the best right now, and they, they're solid in their personnel, so uh, they're one of the best teams. And um, uh, a win against them would be in, uh, inspiring, and it would be substantive. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's what it is. Uh, and we are going to have to go by them beginning Monday uh, and uh, Sunday, I think. But uh, we're going to have to go by them Sunday. And if we have aspirations, uh, I think we'll have to go by them again uh, later in the year. Good Super observation, Bowl goes Jerry. Just San knowing Francisco. the game. Hey, good observation, Jerry. Just yeah. at least knowing you're traveling yeah. and going to the game. Good God Almighty. Yeah. It's Again, not another old person in his 80s hey, who sounds hey, like hey, hey, Dick hey. Buckus, <laughs> <laughs> my mother. <laughs> well, you think you think they'll let us yeah, cut Jerry's Jerry open years see old. if he got a little bit? You think they'll let us cut Jerry yeah, Brady open he... <laughs> if he got a little bit too? <laughs> he played football, didn't he? For the, he played uh, at Arkansas, yeah. yeah what I say, he played that, Arkansas. Can we have a little bit of that? Can we have a little bit of that, Jerry? <laughs> 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 anyway, what do you think of his contention that it goes through San Francisco? The Eagles are right there in his division. I think they played in the Super Bowl last year. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I fully get what you're saying, but, you know, the one thing that, you know, y'all like to tell an old defensive guy like me is defense win championships. No, it gives you a chance. And when you look at that side of the ball right now, that's not even close what, what the, <laughs> the Eagles are playing compared to what the San Franciscos are playing as far as defense. Not even close. Not even close. We're talking about middle of the pack right now for the Eagles. And when your offense isn't clicking and Jalen's trying to figure out how many balls I got to get A.J. Brown before this monster of a man gets upset. You know what I'm saying? Have you seen this man? I went out and saw this man walk up on me in Tampa. I said, good Lord, is it legal to be that big? I mean, do you play receiver? You look like a DN, my brother. Good God Almighty, that's a big old man. Jesus Christ. Whoa. So, and Jalen's going through his little thing, you know, with the contract and everything like that. You know, social media, you know, they like to send a lot of DMs, you know. <laughs> I'm sure he's reading the couple, so <laughs> you know how it goes. So, hey, man, you know, you got, you, you don't let your social, don't let your timeline become your lifeline, fellas. That's all I can tell you. Do what Josh mm, did. That's a good Josh. say. Yeah, Josh might have seen my, you know, sap in the lab and he been in, he, he been, he been playing good football lately. There you go, headless horseman. There you go. <laughs> I might, I might call him. Yeah, great football. Say, you got a head, but ain't no screws in it. Cause sometimes they come loose. <laughs> but he's been playing some excellent football lately. Excellent. Ooh. Uh, the Patriots haven't been. They got housed what by the I Cowboys. What did I tell you? I know that's did what I tell you. Wasn't no Bill Belichick uh, aura no more. Bill Belichick has a quarterback that should not be starting in the National Football League. It's not even funny. I've heard high, late, and over the middle. But what Mac Brown did when he rolled down and went back across the field past the other hash to the bottom of the numbers, shit, me and you could have picked that one off with a lot. That, that was up there a long time. This, this young man, and then Belichick, the Patriot way, dead. Josh McDaniel, listen up. That Patriot way when you're not Belichick doesn't even start. <laughs> it, it's not even something you talk about. But right now, I told you, it's it's an unfamiliar football team that's being played underneath one of the greatest coaches. I mean, the greatest coach. I mean, you can't you can't deny that. I mean, he's not gonna catch the wins because right now he's looking at about five six wins a year for the next what six seven years. So it's at 30, 35 wins. Oof, and he's at one ninety nine now. He won't catch Shula. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. that's interesting. He he, yeah, he, he, won't, he, won't, he won't, catch won't catch Shula. Shula. Oh, he won't catch Shula. Not with this team. No. Not with this cast of characters. I can't name you nobody on he that same subject. He's at 199. Well, he was, yeah, He's at 299 yeah. right now. Bill yeah. Belichick is He's at, at 299. 299. 299. 299. Yep. He needs 29 more wins a time. 30 to pass. Huh. And you're, you're saying you don't... Wow. So you did call him the greatest coach, and that was kind of my question. Oh, yeah. 
Is oh, there no. anything that could happen that could diminish his GOAT status? I mean, just keep putting that product that's on the field right now because that's not a good football team. It's not fundamentally sound. They don't play situational football very well. I mean, the quarterback, I mean, I know you had Tom Brady, but he had to groom Tom to that level. Tom didn't just show up, you know, with six championships. You know, Tom worked his way to that. And Mac Brown just doesn't have it. And Mac Jones. We, Mac, Mac Jones. Who? Mac Jones. That's right. That's my homeboy kept yelling to me, Mac Jones. I'm like, the Jones guy don't have it. And I know, you know, him and Saban has this relationship that, you know, he gets a lot of the Alabama players. This was one he wasn't supposed to take. He should have took Tua or Jalen Hurts or one of those guys, <laughs> one of them quarterbacks that used to play at Alabama <laughs> called Mac Jones ain't it, buddy. I'm telling you, I mean, I watched it the week one with the Eagles. The Eagles gave him the game. But Mac couldn't drive him through it. I mean, he kept giving it to him. At the end of the game, he's still driving to beat him. And, and the D-line is dead tall, dead tired. Jalen Carter looked like he just got out of a popka high. He, he couldn't get a rush at the end of the game. And Mac could not make the throw. I mean, not even close to one. Uh, I want to show you uh, a highlight from the LSU game. Oh. Uh, and and <laughs> it post is it LSU football? game. <laughs> is it football? <laughs> Ole Miss. It is LSU defensive lineman Cole copped a uh, a kid that stormed the field. Do we do we have that video? I, 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 yes, we do. Play that video of the LSU. I want you to. I want to compare it to something else. Go ahead, play that video. Oh, let's go! LSU. Oh no! Now you want to do the fight? Or what? Let's go, baby! Yeah, he ran up on him cussing and yelling and oh, got no, 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 to the no, ground. Oh, no, 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 I got all of that. I, he, he, he has no idea that he's about to bump into him. No idea. And the fact that he bumped into him was like, oh, oh, oh. That, that should have told number 90 in your program, number 473 million. Seven, three, hundred thousand and whatever in your heart. Way down the list. That What are you doing? First of all, I blame the coach. Because the coach should have said, fellas, we lose this game. They're going to storm the field. Ole Miss don't have many big victories in their history. They got one Sugar Bowl or two of them. And that's that's the whole thing for them is just to go to the Sugar Bowl. They don't even talk about a national championship in Oxford. That, uh, you have to understand your opponent. Now, I understand this is a rivalry game, the Magnolia Bowl, Magnolia Trophy, whatever it is. You have to identify what is going to happen. They're going to storm the field. So if we lose this game, I need everybody to be lying to the locker room. We don't need no incidents. That's first. Second, son, what are you doing? And then after he done cold cop the kid, because he know the kid didn't want to fight. It ain't like the kid put up his dukes like, come on with it. Ah, this kid's like, oh my God, you know, I just bumped into it. Was probably finna say I'm sorry until he jumped in his face. I mean, bumped him. And then after you do this, something in your mind should say, you know what? I'm 6'5, 290. He bumped into me. I might get away with the, you know, I had a reaction, but it really wasn't that not, it wasn't that fast of a reaction. If he'd have bumped him and he'd have just, you know, slapped back, that would have made sense. But he squared him up. Watch this. LSU, boom, bumping it to him. Then, ah, man, it was a, it was pretty quick. I give him that. He might have got away with that, but now this right here, what, what are you finna do? You finna fight him some more? Yeah, when he made the face at you, not, not what you want to do. You, 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 what? Come on, come on, stop. You, you, you got a natural reaction out of it. You, you, you might have got away with that one, but you, but your secondary, you know, no, the coach and him dead wrong. The kid's wrong, too, for jumping over the thing and bumping into him, but come on. I mean, it's Saturday night. The kid the kid done had nine too many. <laughs> Let him enjoy the win, man. You had to punch him in the mouth, but I think I think he'll get away with punching him in the mouth because he was not supposed to be there. 
and it was a natural reaction pretty quick, uh, you know. But the the secondary now you now what you want to stomp him? You want to stomp him out? You know you you ain't do that to the rebels that were playing. So don't do it to the rebels that are now running <laughs> on the field. To, run on to the run on to the locker room, son. That's what you do. Run, <laughs> go. You got bumped into. Look around. Uh, like, I'm, come on. That 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 kid I was ran all the way. That kid ran all the way from the end zone, all the way across the fifty. Nanik should have been out of there. I don't know what homeboy he was trying to holler at or exchange jerseys, all that little whatever foo foo mess they do after the game. But I wasn't with that. If you knew me, you had my number. I'm going to the locker room, dog, after this game. Right? No coaches, none of that. All right, I'm going straight to the locker room. You won't see me. See me on the other side. Unless it will fall. I went. In, I went and saw certain quarterbacks. I went and saw certain quarterbacks. I will say that. That's how I got into it with Sherman with Green Bay. <laughs> I didn't go straight to the locker room that day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he dead wrong. I was going to ask you about uh, Evan Neal, but I don't want to now because you you Evan you. Neal. What happened with Evan Neal? Who's that? Offensive tackle for the Giants. He he yelled and screamed at Savannah. I don't want to deal with it. I want to. I want to add my final thing. I want to talk to you about. Yelled and screamed at who? No, you can't do that to me. Come on. Some yelled fans. And scream at who? Some fans. Yeah. It was. Oh, stop that. It Those was silly. Pay their money, man. What? Grow up. <laughs> the, the, boy, these kids way too sensitive, man. What? What? You you're in the entertainment business, and if I pay good money to see you go out there on that field and you ain't performing, I am going to say something out of my mouth. I mean, the stuff I used to deal with when I first got in this league with them, them drug tests was crazy, what the fans would say to me on the road. He had to have some tough skin, baby. I, I, it gets so good one time I say, I heard it all. And then one of them said something, I say, you know what, I haven't heard that one. That's a good one. I mean, because you hear it. You, I mean, come on. Come on. Don't, don't, don't play yourself, man. Come on. Jesus Christ. Grow up. That's what uh, I tell them. Grow up. Finally, Sap, I, I got to ask you about uh, the National Football League and its new infatuation uh, with Taylor Swift. Uh, th- there's even rumors that, I don't know if you've seen this, there's rumors that uh, she's going to be on the cover of uh, Madden 25, uh, Taylor, <laughs> Taylor Swift. Uh, <laughs> Travis Kelsey has even gone on record like, hey, man, the NFL, maybe we're going a little bit overboard. We're doing a little too much with Taylor Swift. You got a problem with the NFL pandering to Swifties? I always say the bigger the crowd, the better the stage. Last time I checked, so, I mean, we're talking about people that normally wouldn't watch football that's that's engaged in the game right now, you know? And Kelsey know that. They're not a match, so that's why he's saying they're going a little far. They ain't got a show coming out where he had 50 women from 50 different states in line for him. Oh, I don't know. Hey, I don't know. About I think he got a. I think he got a reality show coming out. 50 women from 50 states after Kelsey. Yeah, <laughs> he invited this. Come on, man. You can you can't date a star like that and not expect nobody to you know show her. Come on, All right. What happened when Tony Romo had what was the girl up in there bouncing up and down with the number nine? Jessica on? Simpson. Yeah, there you go. I mean, come on, we had, we had fun with that too. But the Cowboys are horrible, so it's easy to go with them. You know, the Chiefs are pretty rough, and you know that quarterback is is, is one bad man. So. They're going to they gonna be on the scene for a while. You know, it was fun with Romo because he ain't going to play well and then she got to go console him. So that was the fun part of that. <laughs> Catching Kelsey. He's right. Catching Kelsey. Kelsey. He dated 50 yeah, women absolutely. from 50 different states at one time. Trust me. She's got a movie do- coming out that that's going to hit theaters in the next week. And this is all orchestrated. Oh, it's all not, I don't think part. any hey, of it's real. Hey, the, the Swifties are in line for the purchase. And in line for the team. <laughs> the, the, she's a marketing genius. I mean, you got the you got the grandest stage, the National Football League in the fall. We don't even know they're playing baseball right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And they got a pitch clock. And you can watch it real fast now. It's a great game now. I love baseball right now. Boy, the pitch clock was the greatest thing they did. Oh, thank God. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Warren, I'm out of questions. We're out of time. I'm gonna let you go. How did Taylor Swift do it? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I'm all on board, man. The bigger the crowd, the better our show, and the more people watching. We're locked. That's all, it, baby. Hey man, we we invite some Swifties over here, man. Let's have a good time with them, man. Let's see what kind of people they are. What kind of drink they like? What kind of food they eat? <laughs> 
That's how I define yeah, my I friends. Had a swift, I, I would you like to drive? Yeah, I, I had, had a swift like run me out of. <laughs> oh no, run you out of where? California. <laughs> California is well, the place for a couple swifties. Hey, man, that's why I come down to Hollywood, Florida, baby. It ain't for everybody, but it might be for us, baby. <laughs> I like Nashville, too, now. That's, not, that's nice action, too. So. You're in a good spot, baby. Stay right there. Stay right there. Don't go back to California. <laughs> Jed said, move away from there. Thank you, Warren. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great job, as always. Uh, stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Steve Kim next. No regrets and our decisions. We don't want to go to heaven with freedom. It's my obligation. No hate, discrimination. Raising up your hands for freedom. Previously on Fearless. You know, I had gotten hurt. I had this crazy golf accident, and, and I was... I mean, I was, I could have been killed like that. It was a, a crazy random thing that happened. And a couple of the, the off camera women, um, including one that was also on camera was going to come over and, um, just hang out with me. And I was pretty, I was a mess, pretty beat up. And then it was, um, well, listen, we just, if we do this, we can't have it on Instagram or anything. We can't, you know, I love her, but you know, I can't be seen with her. Like friend, friend, people who knew my yeah. parents, knew my family, knew my kids. Um, and so th those are the things that hit, that hit me the most. Those other people who are just mouthy and looking for clicks and wanting to crush me for whatever random reason, I, I don't care. I, I do not care about those people. Go for it. I, I choose to live in positivity and surround myself with, with that kind of energy. Uh, and, and it also is faith-based where I'm not, I'm not going there. According to a recent study of hundreds of post-abortive women, 60% of women reported that they would have preferred to give birth if they had received more support from others or had more financial security. And that's where Preborn steps in. Preborn is there for women in their darkest hour, deciding between life and death of their precious child. You see, the reality is women are being pressured to make this fatal decision, are being told that their babies are just clumps of cells. Preborn welcomes women with God's love and introduces them to the beautiful life growing inside of them, which doubles their baby's chance of life. When you support Preborn, you not only support women, you empower them. Your donation of $28 will help a woman to make a choice that she won't have to regret for the rest of her life and gives her the ultimate blessing life. Your love can save a life. Just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby or visit preborn.com slash fearless. That's preborn.com slash fearless. Time for your favorite host, the star of this show, Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell. Uh, Steve, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, I know you're looking forward to the weekend and weekend of college football, but I want to start by talking about uh, Marshawn Lynch and his recent comments, conversation uh, that he had with Shannon Sharp about his relationship with Russell Wilson. I just talked about this with Warren Sapp. Uh, earlier in the show, I think, Steve, there's a case to be made to some degree that we're being a tiny bit unfair to Russell Wilson. We're piling on a guy that's socially awkward, a bit nerdy, he's mixed race, and, you know, he's like Tiger Woods, but he plays quarterback. He plays in a team sport. He has to be a leader. Warren, not that sympathetic. Uh, to Russell and saying, look, man, it's the job of a quarterback. You got to touch all aspects of the locker room, even someone as rough around the edges as Marshawn Lynch. Where do you stand on this? I actually slide with Warren a little bit. I'm kind of thinking about, you know, Russell Weirdo, as I like to call him. He's actually played fairly well this year, but look, would I rather have my quarterback be steaming Willie Beeman, the first true multi-purpose threat in football history, or a grown-up version of Carlton Banks? Because that's what 
Russell Wilson reminds me of. If, if Carlton Banks suddenly became a football player and he had to lead a locker room, this is where Warren and every other player that's been in that locker room will tell you. As a quarterback, especially one that is well-known and considered to be elite, you have to be a galvanizing figure within that organization. So whether you're the number one receiver, the star cornerback like Richard Sherman, or even the long snapper, you have to be that guy that kind of says, hey, I'm here for you. And look, I don't think these guys have to be pen pals. They don't have to text each other at night. They don't even have to be on group chats. But when you have a quarterback that you cannot just call as another star player and dial up their number, I think there's an issue, Jason. You've been in that locker room before. You really think that in modern-day football, in the age of the smartphone, that that will play well on any team or organization? I have a hard time believing that. So do I. And I'm not saying Russell's doing everything appropriately, but I'm saying he's j if he played any other position, no one would care that he's a weird guy, that, that, that he's afraid of Marshawn Lynch, who, you know, is really rough around the edges for lack of a more, I could say, he's ghetto. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's ghetto. It's like talking to a gang member. And Russell Wilson, he ain't built for that. If a basketball center was six foot two and played another position, nobody would care. But he's a center, so he needs to be 6'10". Part of the quarterback requirement is that you have to be good in the locker room. You have to be a galvanizing figure who can get everybody running the same direction. People have to believe that the person leading them knows where they're going. And they have no idea if what... Russell Wilson is saying is actually his thought or something he read out of a magazine that he's repeating. Yeah, Jason, hold on. You could nope. say, well, if he no. wasn't a quarterback, hello, he is. Bottom line, he is. He gets, <laughs> he gets all the privileges. He gets all the star treatment. And can I tell you something? There was a time years ago when I thought it was unfair that Russell Wilson was not down enough. He wasn't urban enough. I get it. But my perspective has changed based on new information, okay? My opinion has evolved. And can I tell you something? Whether I'm Marshawn Lynch, Cam Chancellor, Richard Sherman, or anybody else, with the way that second Super Bowl played out, because I remember distinctly watching it, Marshawn Lynch gets the ball, and he takes it to right around the edge of the goal line. Dante Hightower makes a great play. So I believe it was second and goal. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is perfect. One more run to beast mode, you're back-to-back, -back, you're making history, you are now in the books as a mini-dynasty, but instead, and, and again, uh, a lot of this is on Pete Carroll, because I don't think he played to win the game. Hello, he played to an agenda. He didn't want to just win the game, he wanted to win the game with another guy being the face of the victory and not Marshawn Lynch. Let me just tell you something, I'm completely with Marshawn Lynch. That when he says he laughed right in Pete Carroll's face and walked off the field, you know what? I understand it. I get it. And in fact, you know what? I endorse it. Because when you put the needs or an agenda of one person over winning the ultimate game, you deserve that heat. I'm going to help your point even more and why these guys can't let it go. There is a major difference between being a one-time Super Bowl champion and a back-to-back two-time Super Bowl champion. In there's an economic impact to that. Yes. In terms of just like your reputation, your brand, your Hall of Fame credentials, as opposed yes. to being a two-time Super Bowl champion. And so I get why they can't let it go. And <laughs> but it's more. Uh, it's more Pete Carroll's fault than Russell Wilson. And that's where I think uh, the, the, the worst part of that interview, in my view, is, is when he told the story about how you're not allowed to talk or criticize Russ. Pete said, if you got something to say, say it to me and I'll deliver it to Russ. If you can't talk to your own quarterback, what have you just created in your locker room? I think that's 100%. Now, Pete Carroll's just recognizing that Russell Wilson's weird and he's trying to protect him. So, But it's a combination of both. If you ever want Russ to grow out of being Russell Weirdo, you need to let his own teammates talk to him. For, 
He's just te- I, 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 I've, and he he's playing quarterback. And so I played with the guy. James Franklin was just as weird. Really? Oh my gosh! Yes. <laughs> and and look, I like the guy, but he he certainly wasn't a connect with all the teammates guy. And it it just to be totally honest. People don't like when I'm honest about it. It hurt us. And Jason. Huh. TJ, once Russell started dating that pop star, Ciara, or however you pronounce it, I also think that he changed fundamentally. And his priorities or the way he came off was even more skewed. And a lot of guys were like, oh, God. Because, look, if he would have just been like the average guy like him and, and just stuck with a Becky, it would have been great. But now he's with some, like, pop star that – had a baby with future, and I think that changed the whole dynamic. And then he started putting out like these really cringeworthy social media videos after he signed that big contract where he's underneath the sheets with Ciara, and they're they're saying, "Hey, Seattle Nation, we're here forever." And then a year later, he's demanding a trade. Then he gets to Detroit. Then he gets to Denver, and he tries to like shove "Let's Ride" down everyone's throat, which <laughs> that that didn't play well. And then he does these videos like. I'm Mr. M- Unlimited. I'm Mr. Uh, I'm like, oh, God, someone take away his phone. Get him a flip phone. Get him a unit and take away his phone. The guy is just super cringe. I wouldn't follow that guy either. Let's be honest about it. I, I'm completely on Marshawn Lynch's side here. I'm, I'm team beast mode. Can you name another quarterback who's this weird? Well, you just said James Franklin, the <laughs> Mizzou quarterback, but I'm trying to – NFL quarterback who was this – I'm sure there's been some. I'm trying to think of – Like Peyton Manning's like. But I will tell you, Tom in the locker room, everybody liked him, but, he, you know, it's and, – and he could connect with the guys, but it's not like he doesn't quite have the humor that Peyton Manning has. He connects sort of in different ways. I'd say Tom's slightly bit more – Guys different. loved Peyton Manning. Yeah. He went out and socialized with him. Uh, I'm sort of different, like dating a supermodel, yeah. you know, but I wouldn't put Tom anywhere near Russ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. no, I'm trying <laughs> Philip hey. Rivers, what's he got, 10 kids? That's a little weird. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, people like him, though. Yeah, I know. People love him, yeah. Yes, Eli. Model, people like never. Eli better than they like Peyton. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, look, the one thing with Tom Brady, I, I heard a story from, I believe it was a Rudolph, the tight end that just retired, He was on that last season in Tampa Bay, and he's on a podcast, and they said, what's it like being Tom Brady's teammate? He said, basically, Tom Brady is the greatest guy. That He had his own locker next to his locker for all the autograph requests that every single player would come up with, footballs, helmets, something to sign for little Jimmy, and they'd have little Post-it notes like, hey, can you sign this to, hey, mom and dad, your son's a great teammate, Tom, and he would do it every day. And he said, the thing that stood out is whether you were the Glazers or the Janitor, the way Tom Brady would greet you and treat you was always the same with the utmost respect. That type of That's stuff, true. I think, stands out on a day-to-day basis where you're like, you know what? It must be tough being Tom Brady. I wouldn't want to do it for more than 20 minutes a day. But we see the type of example that he sets in his play. That gets respect. I guarantee you, yeah, Russell Wilson, he had his own office where Sean Payton said, that office, you're out of here. Come on. The, the guy deserves the heat, Jason. Let's not make him into this sympathetic figure. He did this to himself. Wasn't Andrew Luck a bit of a goofball? He was a goofball, but he was kind of a likable goofball where, yeah. where his teammates sort of it, – it's interesting. The, the big difference, I think, between – and I'll say this in defense of James Franklin. James, you know, had some quirks, but I think James was 100% James. Like, he was authentic. I don't think anybody believes the Russell Wilson that they're getting is actually Russ. Who is Russ? Does Russ know who Russ is? And that's a problem. Jason. It's been a weird ride for him. From from day one, from draft day, when his first wife got caught with that picture of her looking like a deranged. (laughs) (laughs) Her mouth wide open. That was a horse mouth. Yeah. It's been a weird ride. I, I would react that way, too. The only thing that was missing was those big checks, like, right? But anyway, I, I mean, look, last year, I think the Denver went on one of those trips to Europe. They got to play that football game that nobody cares about. In the middle of the flight, the guy starts doing high knees in the aisle between the, the, in the plane. And I, like, if I'm a teammate and I'm trying to get some sleep and I see some guy trying to do wind sprints, 
all right, through the economy class, I'd be like, sit your ass down. Come on. It, that's not going to play well. All right, speaking of weird quarterbacks, here's one that, that I don't think it's ever been – he didn't play, he wasn't a star long enough for it uh, to be a big deal. But I think RG3 was a weirdo and is a yeah. weirdo. And, yeah. and he, here's RG3 with his little broadcasting career. Uh, you know, he got in some trouble last week and uh, made a really odd, weird. I can't wait to hear both y'all's takes on this. But here's RG3 making a Jesus crucifixion comparison during the LSU Ole Miss game. You want to see a defense that's playing like their hair's on fire? Look at everybody flowing to the football. Get your hat to the ball. Don't give him an opportunity to use those sweet feet to potentially get a first down. The coverage was there. They lifted that man up to the sky like he was Jesus, letting them know they're going to put him on the cross right there. Wow. What's he thinking? <laughs> what? 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 I have a theory, but I want to hear y'all's first. What, what's it, Steve, what are you, what's he thinking? What's he trying to do? I, look, 90% of that was good. It was great because that was a, a very exciting SEC shootout. And then he had to go there. He had to go there. I just, I don't know. I've, look, um, I have a theory about why RG3 sometimes can be so pro-black is because uh, – you know, like Terrell Owens, he went white and he stayed light, so he has to like make up for it um, and stay on code in different ways. But that that was unfortunate. I don't have that much heat for him. I just would have said keep the whole religious thing out of there and let no more crucifixion crucifixion talk. Oh, I don't have a great. I have no idea what he was thinking. I have no great theory. I think here's my real theory. I think he's a Christian that's halfway in his mind. He started going down a road and then had to finish it, <laughs> lifting him up like he's Jesus. No, wait, that's a good thing. No, but I put him on a cross. That's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll put him on the cross. I think he got stuck. I think he's looking for an opportunity to uh, promote his faith during a broadcast. And... I think he's going out of his way of that because, one, I think he realizes how much of the other stuff that he's doing on TV directly contradicts his Christian walk. I think every, I, when you talk about a guy that's phony and not showing who he really is and who's doing a lot of things to, because he's halfway ashamed of this blonde wife he's got, and so he's doing this pro-black shtick to try to keep the social media heat off of him. And, uh, and so he was looking for a way to express his faith uh, rather than being authentic. It's a force. It's something he had given it some thought. He, he, not those specific words, but he had made up his mind, I'm going to make some kind of Christian reference during the broadcast game. And that's going to be, and it blew up in his face. He sounded stupid because it's not coming from a real and authentic place. Now, you think Dan Orlovsky's put some heat on him by coming out and doing, you know, what, I do think Dan put some pressure on a lot of the Christians yeah. at ESPN. No, I think this show does. Oh, well, this show does. <laughs> I think it put pressure on Orlovsky and all these guys. This weekend, Tua came out and had a whole big, you know, it's hard for me to even play on Sundays because I'm supposed to be at church and I know it. There are some guys coming out in their faith. I could see him feeling some of that pressure. That was so weird, though. It's like a defense lifting a guy up like he's Jesus. People will be irate with me for saying this. But I'm t everybody's paying attention to my Dion conversation. And it's putting pressure on everybody. And that's the purpose of this show. And all, all this phony Christianity, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put a gun to my own head and everybody else. Kind of, uh, you know, l let's get real. But anyway, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead, jump in. One last thing on this. I, I mean, the way that de game was, I think both teams nearly gave up 50 points or right around. Um, they, everyone played defense like atheists on that particular game. So that was the wrong game to kind of <laughs> invoke. <laughs> oh, no, it was a high scoring game. That's all I'm saying. It was, it was like, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm just making Steve, a point. I'm, I'm just, I'm, no, I'm going to try to lob you, lob you another softball. 
Uh, Taylor do. Swift, see if you got anything cooked up on that. Uh, Taylor Swift has uh, taken over the NFL. The NFL released a statement uh, basically defending its promotion of Taylor Swift. Uh, but there, it, it's gotten so bad, Travis Kelsey has said, hey, maybe we've done a bit too much. Uh, and so now there are memes. There's a meme <laughs> out where she may be on the cover of the Madden 25 video game. Uh, your, your, <laughs> your thoughts on, uh, is the NFL going a bit too far with Taylor Swift? Yeah, but it's to be expected. But this whole thing about any individual, whether it's Taylor Swift or another celebrity or an iconic figure, which she is, okay, I'm not a fan, but it says a lot about the idol worship and the cult-like following that we have for celebrities in America or maybe all the world today. Okay, maybe I'm the outlier. I could not name you one Taylor Swift song. Uh, sometimes I get up on Twitter and I'll see that Taylor Swift tickets are going for an arm and a leg. Did she do first. Pound Town? Isn't no, Taylor Swift on Pound Town? That's Sexy Dead. By the way, some new video on oh, Sexy, sexy Dead. Oh, Sexy Dead. She lied about certain body parts about her. Okay. Uh, yes, she it turns did. Out, yes. turns out wrong. <laughs> but anyway, it's a family show. But I, 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 I think the thing about Taylor Swift, about how popular she is, now I don't really get it. Uh, I haven't listened to any music post-1995 in a very long time. I'm Right now, I'm on a Huey Lewis and the News binge. So, But it, it does say a lot about how culture today lifts figures almost to a godlike status. Now, I'm a square. When I watch a football game, get this, guys, I actually just care about the actual game. Who sits in the luxury box or the owner suite really makes no difference to me, you know, but the fact that now even Travis Kelsey is kind of pushing back against it, I would ask Travis this, what did you think you were getting into? So I, I'm all, I've am i been tired of it. There's already a fatigue of it. Um, I, I think that people have warped priorities in terms of who they look up to. Uh, I ask these people that are Swifties, as they call them, um, would you rather see Taylor Swift in concert with the backstage pass or would you rather see your mom and dad who are deceased one last time to tell you you love them? Which would be more meaningful to you? And if it's the answer that I think it is for a lot of these people, you have very, very warped priorities. Uh, on that note, Steve, I'm going to ask you about uh, Kirk Cousins. Hmm. Uh, he attended a Minnesota Twins yeah. playoff game, I believe yesterday or the day before, Everybody's making a big deal out of it because he bought his own ticket online and just went to the game as a normal uh, citizen. And everybody's now saying it's the greatest thing in the world. I mean, oh, my God. Look at Kirk Cousins. Look how heroic this is that he attended a baseball game and didn't use his privilege to get tickets and seats. It, it is, are we, is, this, to me, strikes me as a Chris Rock getting credit for what you're I take care of my kids. Well, you're supposed to. I mean, you want a cookie? You want a trophy? Uh, that's how it kind of strikes me. And I like Kirk Cousins. He's a believer. I think he's an authentic believer. I think he carries himself amazingly well. Wish he was slightly better quarterback. But I, I like Kirk Cousins, but I, I just don't know if this is as big a deal as we're making it out to be. Yeah, I mean, maybe he wanted to see what postseason success looked like, okay? But with that said, <laughs> I kid. I kid. All right, now look. Um, there's something very normal and average about him that I do admire. But I think it says a lot about us as the American public that we just can't leave that guy alone. It, it, I'm just being dead serious with you. If that was Kirk Cousins next to me, number one, I, I wouldn't know it was Kirk Cousins. But I wouldn't go around making a big deal. I wouldn't ask him for a selfie. I wouldn't ask him for a picture. Uh, I wouldn't even really want to talk to him. Because quite frankly, I don't. I, th that's his time with this family. And it's really too bad that the word started spreading that, oh, my God, it's Kurt. Leave the guy alone. Let, let the guy have his time with his family, enjoy a ball game, and let him leave in peace, people. Good grief.
The reason beyond, because the, the big report is what you talked about, like he bought his own tickets, went and got it. I, the thing that people thought was fascinating was that he just sat field level with everybody else. And that yeah. was weird for a starting quarterback in the NFL to just be sitting next to random fans. Normally they're in a suite. You can certainly afford it. You could go buy, if you want to buy your own tickets, you can buy them in a suite and not call in a favor. I don't know why people are leaning into that because that's all the news reports. But the, the reason it went viral to start with is some dude was like, hey, are you Kirk Cousins? What are you doing down here? <laughs> that, it was sort of the every man kind of deal that people are picking out. Uh, to me, that's why you, a way bigger deal than just buying your own tickets. Like it is kind of strange, particularly as a quarterback that's not doing well this year. Um, the Vikings are not good. I think I would want to protect my family. And so I might have them isolated a little bit away from everyone. Hmm. Mm. All right. That's a different way to think about it. All right, Steve, enjoy your football weekend. Go ball state. Uh, I have my plane ticket. <laughs> I have my plane ticket. Okay. I, I, I have my plane ticket. Uh, I, I can just say that. I have my plane ticket. I'll repeat right, that again. I have my plane weekend. ticket. Weekend. Yeah, you have your plane ticket. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. All right. Uh, Tennessee Harmony next. Brett Favre on running backs. Previously on Fearless. I want some defensive player to say, oh, so I got to hit Derrick Henry up high and in the chest. That's the only way I can bring him down? No, that ain't Hit him fair. in the thigh. <laughs> Wrap up his thighs. I, I, I know easier said than done, but <laughs> a major injury for a running back is going to occur going below the knees. Uh, and, and that was – a great example the other night. It, it and it's it's funny to hear. Why don't you have any sympathy for them? Why don't you feel sorry for them? You just don't feel sorry for anybody. It's well, a tough game. Well, no, it's, it, it, it's the it's the nature of the game today. It's a pass happy league. Uh, you know, uh, Derrick Henry's probably one of the only, maybe the only running back where they just grind it out, hand it to him. Uh, those days are long gone. All right, welcome back. Time for some Tennessee Harmony. Uh, Anthony Walker here with us in studio. Virgil in Atlanta. TJ Moe here with us in studio. Anthony, uh, bless us with a prayer. Father God, we're thankful for today. We're thankful for your blessings. Father, help us uh, as we navigate through life's challenges to always go back to your word, uh, always find the guidance that you have put for us in your word. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. So I shared yesterday that uh, I'm reading the book of Judges and, and because, you know, I was thinking about uh, what went on in politics this weekend and how eight people had disrupted things and it made me think of Gideon and the story of Gideon. So I started reading parts of Judges just to refresh my memory so I could make it a part of my conversation yesterday. But today, I just, because I, I'm now committed to this weekend, I'm going to spend my weekend reading Judges and reading uh, people's commentaries about the book of Judges. And so I just wanted uh, Virgil and Anthony to give me a warm up of what to expect, what is the, the point of the book of Judges. Obviously, I have a layman's understanding that I shared uh, on the show uh, yesterday or Wednesday, I believe. And so anyway, I, I just wanted Virgil and Anthony and TJ will chime in as well. What are the major takeaways from the book of Judges in general and then Gideon and his story in particular? Mm. Anthony, uh, right. get us rolling. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Um, if you wanted to look at the major theme of the book of Judges, it falls under a cycle. We're looking at a cycle of Israel in their relationship with God. And the cycle tends to go from, all right, sin. And then because of their sin, 
punishment or oppression. You could put it in both because there are times in God's punishment where he allows Israel to be overtaken or allows them to be put under oppression. And then there are times because of his wrath that he directs, hey, I'm going to sin because of your disobedience. So you got sin. Then it goes into punishment and oppression, which leads them to repentance. All right, God, we get it. We understand we were wrong. We turn our ways, but we need you. We, we can't get out of this without you. And then that's the last part, deliverance. So you'll see that cycle happen time and time again. Sin, oppression, punishment, repentance and deliverance. That's the major themes of the book. So when you're looking, look for that cycle. As it relates to Gideon, you find that Gideon's narrative coming at a point of punishment. The Midianites, God has allowed to uh, oppress uh, Israel and Gideon, he and his family are uh, of one of the weakest, smallest tribes. Gideon even sees himself. He says, God, I'm the smallest in my dad's house and we are the smallest, weakest tribe. And God uses Gideon as a means to show his providence and his power. So that's the he's working on Gideon while at the same time working on the larger uh, Israel in delivering them from the Midianites. Virgil, chime yeah, in here. I, I, yeah, I think I think it's a great way to set it up. There's a there's an even larger meta narrative, a larger picture that you could kind of take a look at uh, as it relates to. Uh, the story of mankind as you as you get to the book of Judges, as you get to Gideon, it's it's the idea of we're, we're learning about through Scripture, God, man, sin, Christ and then resurrection. God, man, sin, Christ and resurrection. It's, it's the gospel story throughout the whole text. And what we're learning about those mm -hmm. things are through different points in times historically at, uh, you know, as we as we're witnessing in this instance. The, the people of Israel, the people of Israel have their God uh, as as man. They have sinned against this holy God. They've involved themselves in sin there. And as a result of sin, they find themselves in oppression, primarily the sin that you're dealing with in uh, book of Judges, whether it's Kings, first Kings, second Kings, whether it's Judges is the sin of idolatry. They go and, uh, and worship idols, uh, all kinds of different gods. Uh, as a result of that sin, what you then have is is, is, is a Christ figure or a Christ-like individual. And so in this instance with, with Gideon, he comes in, a flawed man, though he is, uh, and, and tries to, to, to in, encourage the people of Israel to, to repent of these things and to follow the voice of God, to follow the, the command of God. As they follow God, regardless of the number, the numbers are reduced, his army is reduced in size. As they follow God, them aligning themselves, the people of Israel aligning themselves with God are a majority, right? So they, they, they are the majority. And as a result, they, 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 they get what back the, 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 the blessings of God, the blessings from God that were intended to them. So again, Gideon kind of represents a, a Christ-like figure in, in causing the people of Israel to follow God, to repent of God, to repent from their godlessness. Uh, and as a result, they experience quote unquote resurrection, a, a, a right setting of their, 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 their lives, of what they've experienced prior to uh, the sin that, that came into place. But what you're gonna find though, as a result of, of even looking at all the figures through judges, what you're going to find is that none of them are sufficient uh, to to see Israel uh, maintain that standing with God. Uh, and, and what, mm -hmm. what all of that leads mm -hmm. to is a need for them to follow Christ. So even as you walk through the, the you know, the, the, the prophets, you understand what's happening to Israel as a result. The, 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 the cycle of God, man sin, cross, or Christ, or a Christ-like figure, right, will lead the people of Israel to repentance with the hope that they'll experience resurrection, eternal life. But that doesn't actually happen until we have Christ and him crucified. And so one of my takeaways is that, like, I'm looking at an analogy of what's going on in America right now. I, I feel like we have an idolatry crisis. People have emailed me and said, hey, Jason, we do have an idolatry crisis, but man, that's been going on forever. JFK was an idol and they rattled off other, you know, 
Marilyn Monroe was an idol and whatever, you know, idolatry. Is a, and my levels of idolatry do ebb and flow or do we, or are they right? It's, it's. Let me, let me, let me put it this way. In our effort to understand scripture, sometimes we simplify a concept, okay? And so a simplified understanding of what idolatry is would be to say anything that you put above God, okay, that becomes an idol. That's simplified. When we understand what was taking place biblically, what idolatry specifically looked at, looked like, these people thought that these idols that they created, these idols that they made out of small figurines, et cetera, they thought they were literally deity. OK, it wasn't hyper focus. It wasn't, oh, you guys are paying so much attention to your money. You've made money into an idol. No, they literally thought this was a deity. The nuanced difference in what we're looking at now, most of the time, what we're describing as idolatry is hyper focus or is, you know, I think Steve Kim used the term that I, I would use our prioritization of other things over God. Very rarely are we finding a scenario where someone is literally saying, OK, this figure, you know, Taylor Swift, when she is God and we must worship her for our salvation, we can't get what we're really looking at is hyper focus. People can't get beyond everything Taylor Swift, everything Taylor Swift or everything, you know, whatever. So that may help you in your understanding of what we're meaning by idolatry. What Gideon was faced up against, Baal, Baal was a pagan deity. They actually worshiped Baal. They had figurines of Baal. They sacrificed. And I know sometimes we look at a, a, um, abortion as a kind of sacrifice to a, a you know, liberalism or whatnot. No, they literally were sacrificing their kid to Baal, this deity, because Baal was going to deliver them spiritually, provide for them spiritually. Does that make? It does make sense. Yeah. I, I, I do want to take, let's take football okay. as an idol. All right. Uh, and and, and, and I, I'm not disagreeing, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to understand that, that we do have a hyper focus on football. Mm -hmm. But that hyper focus does compel us to take actions that are disrespectful to God in sure. terms of people are choosing watching football over church, mm -hmm. over actual mm -hmm. worship. Mm -hmm. and, and so while, you know, it seems like someone could hypothetically make an analogy like, no, football is a deity. We, we treat it like a deity. We, we do things in service and in defense of football and pop stars. And, you know, I, it, it, I could go on social media mm -hmm. and virtually say anything about Jesus that I want. I could be as critical of Jesus as I want, and I'd get some blowback. But if I, Beyonce or Taylor Swift, people lose their mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beehive, the Swifties mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. are, are we not to some, maybe not to that level that you're talking about with mm -hmm. Bale, Ball, but, but have we not made football in some of these things? deities that compel our actions take us away from God. Right. And that's that's more of us leaving God to put these things above whatever it is that that God is supposed to be in our life. I'm just simply making the distinction that no one is looking to them as a source as they would here. They're not looking to them as a source of salvation. They're not looking to them as a source of, hey, I'm going to be spiritually uh, redeemed or by me watching football uh, or, or, you know, giving my attention to this, some kind of spiritual fulfillment and deliverance I'll get from this. It's just this has become all that I focus on. And that piece, which is what the Bible does speak to our focus on all of these other things that take us away from God, we begin to defend it because I don't want to lose what this does and how it makes me feel. But the aim of it, which is, again, Virgil hits on this, the aim at the end of the day is to understand 
that there is no other God. All the rest of them are fake. So you will never be fulfilled from these things. Our problem, though, and it may be another discussion. Our problem, though, is that with football, at least from my estimation, we try to interject God into that. Mm. And now we've got an argument with, well, hey, football, you know, back in the day, the classic line, you know, faith and football and family. It's almost like God is intertwined with football, but <laughs> he wasn't. Virgil, jump back in here. I want to marinate on that because it's a great point. But Virgil, jump yeah. back in and TJ follow in on after Virgil. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I think I, I'm going to push in a little bit on, on what Anthony shared. I, I think he's right. I think if you're looking at the, at, the, at the biblical narrative, that is talking about an actual deity, something that was carved out, you know, from, from stone or from wood or what have you, placed in the space for the purpose of worship. Uh, but it's, it's John Calvin, uh, the great reformer and theologian, who said that the heart of a man is a factory of idols. Uh, and, and so what, what he was talking about didn't have to do with a carved out statue that was a deity, but rather it spoke to the condition of, of the heart of mankind. And, and our heart, our nature, A, is one of worship. We, will, we are creatures of worship. We will worship someone, something, some way, somehow. We will, because of the way that we are designed by nature, worship something. Uh, the reality is when we think about culture, we think about society, I think we've, we're past the stage where anyone is going to, I think if we saw someone going to a, a tree, cutting up the tree, carving out a wood statue and placing it in, the, in, a, in a space or place and said, okay, that's my deity, I'm bow, bowing down, we would think that was foolish. But on the other hand, the very lives that we live are very reflective of the fact that we think of these idols, uh, we, we, call, we call them Hollywood idols, Hollywood stars. We, we, are, we are bowing the knee in some way, some respect to the fact that we value them above God. We live in a godless culture. We live in a pagan society. We live in a space and place where we've neglected the worship of the true and living God. And as a result, because, of, because we are beings who worship, we are going to replace God since we've, since as a culture society, we've, we've set him aside. We're going to remove him. We will replace him with something or someone. And so what you're seeing, witnessing, and I think, Jason, you've articulated well over the course of this last week, uh, starting with the Monday monologue. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not being, uh, being funny there. I'm being serious. You, you created, crafted out. Here is the wooden statue that you are bowing the knee to. You know, it is Deion Sanders, it is Taylor Swift, and here's what that looks like. And when you made that crystal clear in your Monday monologue and have carried it through the, the rest of this week, I don't know how anyone listening couldn't understand the impact of that. And as a result, examine their own lives, not whether or not they were worshiping Dion or whether they were worshiping Taylor Swift, but they're, they're now able to look at what idols do I have in my life that I've elevated to the point where I'm not paying attention to a God in the same way, with the same enthusiasm, with the same tenacity that I am a Taylor Swift, a Deion Sanders, you know, or anyone else uh, uh, for that matter, as it, as it relates to I idolatry. So, and TJ, hop in here, but as it relates to football, and this is where my critique on Monday was coming from, is like, hey, they're changing up football and, and they're using it like an idol, like a deity, because what they want you to do is get your values and your beliefs in alignment with the values and beliefs that they are promoting. Mm -hmm. And so when that's where I think the real danger is, and so it's like, hey, let's bring Taylor Swift and the whole pop music culture into football, and we know that Taylor Swift promotes abortion. We know that uh, she's out registering voters uh, we know that she believes in the matriarchy. Uh, and so it's a way of getting football fans to get their values in alignment with, and hey, Travis Kelsey, one of the biggest stars in football, he's coupled with her, and this is what men should do. Go out and find out, when I saw Micah Parsons tweet out, and, and I'm not trying to be critical of Micah, but he's like, see what a woman can do for you, and uh, the right woman, and fellas, you know, <laughs> learn from this, blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, wow, they're using football to move people's values and to get them in alignment. And, and that's 
from my layman's understanding, like that's dangerous. That's what a deity does. That's what idolatry does. TJ. <clears throat> so I want to fall in on that point, but also uh, um, from the beginning where people said, you know, JFK was an idol and some of these other people. In 1948, only 2% of Americans claimed to be atheist. And so we at least had some values to come back to when we would have an idol, we'd say, no, 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 that's not good. We know that our idol, it, to the degree that you call it, our God is Jesus, right? And so today it's 29%. So you've got a third of the country running around out there with no moral compass, no values. That, and when you're an atheist, the reality is you are your own God. And so that is, that is the Taylor Swift thing. So now it's, this is why I think we have the increase in social justice warriors, because you're your own God and you have your own idea of morality. And well, if you can just get black people to be equal to white people in your own eyes and in how everything goes, well, now you've done something and that really works for you. And so that becomes your idol. And that, whether or not it's sal sal uh, salvation, I, I don't know if people would think that or not, but I do know that most people, including atheists, believe that to the degree that there would be an afterlife, if they're just good enough people, <laughs> that they'll get there. And so now they're their own God. And all of the things, all of these idols that you promote, you promote the good things and you disavow the bad thing. I think that's part of why we have such an obsession with disavowing. I gotta disavow all the bad things. Well, I'm my own God and I have to end up doing more good things than bad things. So I need to disavow those people. I got, I got Jason Whitlock, I, I blocked him on Twitter. Don't, don't worry, I disavow Jason Whitlock. And that, it's all part of the idolatry culture. Mm. I like that point a lot. I, I, I think that, I, I certainly, th the, 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 the thing about 30% or 29% you said are atheists now. I would love to do a study of the people that profess faith, but who are being led to believe that we can operate and embrace the values of atheists while still being a Christian. That's what I think is going on. Is so that, there's a difference though, which what you're pointing out, there's, there's terminology uh, that explains that you've got those who are really Christians and then you've got those who are cultural Christians. They, they wear the name, they talk about it, but they really want to be still kind of popular with everybody, still kind of flow with everybody, but still say. And so if you're really about Christ, if you're really about obeying God's word, you'll stand here regardless of how the atheist feels, regardless of how the rest of what appears to be the majority goes, because you understand, and that was, taking it back to Gideon, that was a part of the fear initially with Gideon, because he's not necessarily having to tear down statues of Baal around the community. It had to start even at his own father's house. So even within our own homes, we have to examine, wait, am I like, what is this that's really that I'm going after? Is it really about God? Is it really about me? Is it really about how I want people to feel? And we have to tear those down initially at home. I expect, and that, that may be a little bit of a difference here. I expect the world to do things to support and, and, and elevate itself. That's yeah. how it always has been. If you look at Ephesians, we studied Ephesians uh, on our prayer call, the goddess of Diana, you know, they worshiped her. Well, what was the premier worshiping point about the goddess Diana? It was sex. So man, we're going to get a whole lot of guys <laughs> and a whole lot of promiscuous and sexually immoral people to be in that angle because, hey, I can kind of relate to that. And there will be other entities like that that will say, hey, we may not be this, but we are this. And now you're seeing this. You're talking about that stat. I just saw one recently about uh, people that identify 50 years ago, people 60 years ago. It was about 2% of those who identified as LGBTQ. Now it's 27%. Yep. Yeah. One in four people say, hey, this is where I am. It, it, it will, so, so it, I'm just saying that, Jason, to say it doesn't shock me that football or Hollywood or anybody else is going to use these things uh, to promote, you know, the lust that we have ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can I point out one more difference here that I think as I was reading through Judges in the Book of Gideon preparing for today, <clears throat> 
God sent messengers to Gideon to tell him what he needed him to do. And then when Gideon still didn't believe, he sent signs, right? It's like he had to have his, his fleece. Okay, it's got to be the only thing with dew. There's no dew on the ground. And then the next day, Gideon was like, that could have been coincidence. Uh, mm-hmm. let's, let's do it again. Let's, do let's the run opposite. it back. <laughs> yeah, like you try that again. God was very patient with him, mm-hmm. um, interestingly. And, but it's like, could God even get our attention today? Because I can't put this down. I'm, it's sitting here. I've got a computer on my lap and my phone yeah. and my iPad's yeah. over there. And that's just I, the difference between 1960 and today or any other time today is if God was screaming at us, we wouldn't even notice. Get put your phone down. Mm. I got my phone in my hand until I go to sleep at night. Mm. My wife and I, my wife is getting away from this. She's like, hey, put your phone down, you know, talk to your kids. It's like, we're, we're actually starting to structure time where when I go home at night, between five and six o'clock, when, the, when we're having dinner, kids, the phone has a spot. So if you don't hear from me, that's why. It's, I'm obsessed like everybody else. I promise when God's talking to me, I guarantee you at some point in my life, God's been screaming at me and I'm scrolling through YouTube <laughs> shorts. Technology is one of the enemies or it's it seems to be working against us now again i've done things with my social media feed that that allow me to get more god-centric stuff fed to me Mm -hmm. and 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 uh but but technology and just all of this the laptop the cell phones the social media apps the 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 just even a phone to be honest with you in terms of of uh, even if you just had a house phone, and people don't get any quiet time and and just prayer time mm-hmm. or where you really can. They had more time to actually talk to God, mm-hmm. and and uh, got to push it on that, Jason. Go ahead, please. It was not necessarily time; it was an intent on ingesting God's word. That's the only way that we have against it. There has always been the assault on our space and time as it relates to temptation and all of this. It's always been. David says, I hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the more we ingest this, I can't control, you know, the arc of technology. And, and I get what the point you're mm-hmm. making. Like it's 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 invasive. It's coming. But the more I put it in here, it's not necessarily you physically putting your phone down. It's you even committing here. Absolutely. I am not. And that's that's the combat that we have against. You know, you were talking about what was it the other day about the Super Bowl. I'm saying, what if men around the world said we're done with porn? What would that do to the world? We're done with promiscuity. We're done with sex workers. We're done with, we're gonna commit to being husbands and fathers. I think you're a thousand percent right, but I think it's, it's like me being done with McDonald's. And I say that there's like steps, there's levels to it. All right. There's me on the Stairmaster and then adding in the weightlifting and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so, I, Porn is our greatest addiction. Sex is our greatest addiction. And so the, the, while I'm starting with the football thing, in my mind is like, mm-hmm. if we can pull this off, it'll give us confidence to take on the, the next even thing. things even more difficult. It doesn't stop there. It, yeah. it, it just, it's really just a starting point. Let, let's, this is a baby step. Let's learn mm-hmm. how to walk uh, and, and get some confidence from that. Because I totally agree with you. You're, mm-hmm. you're a thousand percent right. Our, our addiction to sex and the way they've sexualized the entire society is, is it's the greatest tool that I believe Satan has. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of us. I mean, that's why we're all defining ourselves by our sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. holy cow. Yeah. That did not used to be the case. Right. <laughs> you, had, you know, Virgil, I'm going to give you the final say and then we got to wrap. Yeah, there, there were a lot of things you guys said in that in, in that segment. The, 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 not the least of which was you talked about messages and messengers and and how we're distracted by what it is we we have on, on our phones and, and and the like. You know, apps are a great thing. We, we're developing an app here. I, I've got great things that I could I'll send to you guys as well on that. But more importantly, when I think about messages, 
one of the ways that we've been commissioned to deliver that message is person to person, individual to individual. When you look at evangelical society, uh, statistics tell us that only five to seven percent of all of those who claim to be Christian, only five to seven percent actually share their faith with one other person during the course of a 12 month period. So here we have 100 percent of Christians, five to seven percent of them are willing to share their faith with one other person during the course of a given year. From a standpoint of messaging, that's abysmal. That is absolutely abysmal. And, and we're going to be held to account for that. It's imperative that we go and share the message of the gospel, de- declare the truth that we stand for something. We stand for Christ. We stand for righteousness. We stand for holiness. We stand for goodness. Uh, and and that, that those who repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ will, will I- in- inherit eternal life. Those are the things that we need to proclaim. And the quickest way, Jason, for someone to determine whether or not they're beholden to idolatry is to ask them the question how often they're comfortable delivering that message. If, if they're uncomfortable Ooh. delivering the message of the gospel, then what they are dealing with is some idol in their life that they have a fear of God more than they actually, or fear, rather a fear of man more than they fear God. If you're too afraid to tell somebody about the, about the life transforming power of God, you have a fear of man and not enough of a fear of God to do what's right, what's good, and what will ultimately change lives. Thank you, Virgil. Thank you, guys. Uh, We got to go play up some harmony. Uh, We'll see you next week. How did we end up so divided? Stop fighting and stand tall. To be a nation, one united. Now we're headed for downfall. God let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Harmony. Let's make a simple vow. Let's come together now. Harmony. Put all your weapons down. Love one another now. Harmony. Time for us to wait. Tell us, cause together we're so much stronger. God, let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Harmony. Let's make a simple vow. Let's come together now. Harmony. Put all your weapons down. Love one another now. Get to me Open up your eyes and see